are back. Hello everybody and welcome, I am Scotty Cook alongside my cousin Daniel New, back again for another AZ Off-Road Special. All right, right now we are just outside Page, Arizona and for the next five days we're gonna be touring the Arizona Strip. For a little bit more uh, on that, I give you back to my cousin, the webmaster, Scotty Cook. Thank you, sir. Yes, we are in the Arizona Strip, which is the area of land north of the Grand Canyon up to Utah essentially cut off from the rest of Arizona. Now this place we're gonna be exploring for the next five days is the size of Massachusetts. Holy crap. 8,000 square miles. And it has only about 8,000 people living here, which is probably smaller than at least my hometown. Ouch. Our total journey would take us over 1,000 miles across the Arizona Strip West from near Page, Arizona to end in Las Vegas, Nevada. Of course, along the way, we'd be treated to some of the most incredible sights in Arizona and across the Southwest in general. In our five days, we'd visit White Pocket in the Vermilion Cliffs, the North Rim of the Grand Canyon, Toro Weep, the historic Mount Trumbull Schoolhouse and Grand Gulch Mine, and many other scenic trails. So let's go uh, see what kind of trouble we can get into. All right, let's do it. All righty, let's go. After airing down, we set out north. The trail remained wide and relatively smooth as we paralleled the scenic Vermilion Cliffs. The Vermilion Cliffs is a raised plateau that is part of the intricate Grand Staircase across the southwest that makes up much of northern Arizona and southern Utah. The interesting geology, which includes ancient dunes, makes it a destination for numerous outdoor adventurers, photographers, and off-road enthusiasts. After nine miles, we turned off the easier House Rock Road and began to head east on BLM 1017, up and into the Vermilion Cliffs themselves. It didn't take long and we soon crossed into the official National Monument, which is home to some other great sites like the Wave and Coyote Buttes further north. From here it was 15 more miles to our overnight stop. The road quickly climbed up a less pronounced section of the cliffs and leveled off. On top of the plateau, the road got rougher. Several sections of exposed rocks mingled with long sections of deep and fine sand. We're going northeast right now, and we're supposed to be heading west, because there's something up here that we must see. That's why. That's why we're starting off by heading complete opposite direction to the goal. After several miles, we passed through an old ranch, lined with corrals, vehicles, and a couple of buildings that are still inhabited today. The trail turned left onto BLM 1087 and headed north as things continued to get a bit rougher. Despite the deep sand and our weighed down vehicle, we were able to continue in two-wheel drive for now. We passed through an old gate and soon began to see signs that we were approaching our destination. Oh my God, it's so 
scenic rock formations jutted out of the sandy desert floor, and after a long and bumpy road, we arrived at our destination. How the hell did nature come up with that? We were now at White Pocket, and it felt like we had stepped into another world. After 25 miles of moderately challenging off-road driving and nearly five hours of highway driving from Phoenix, our efforts for the day had paid off. We were beginning our Arizona Strip trip at one of the most spectacular places either one of us had ever been to. It was just after 6 p.m. when we arrived and we immediately set out to investigate. White Pocket consists of bizarre rock formations with pockets of bleached white sandstone that overlays different waves and coves of traditionally red sandstone and some other rock units. The forces of nature over millions of years sculpted this truly bizarre landscape into what it is today. We made camp just a few hundred feet east of White Pocket. When we got out of the Jeep, we found ourselves in super fine sand where even walking around was slightly challenging. We unpacked the Jeep and quickly got the tent set up and air mattresses inflated. We set up our cooking station where we would begin on dinner very soon. We weren't the only ones here at this seemingly remote spot. White Pocket has gained increasing popularity with photographers and tour groups who aren't able to access the nearby Coyote Buttes, also within the Vermilion Cliffs. As the sun set over this scenic area, we lit the propane stove. Tonight's dinner would be a good one. Steak, mashed potatoes, and corn on the cob. Daniel set to work on dinner as I headed out to explore the area some more. About an hour later, dinner was served, and oh boy, was it pretty great. After a long day on the road, we sat in our camp chairs and enjoyed the fantastic dimly lit scenery here just a couple miles south of the Utah border. And even though we began our Arizona Strip trip by heading the wrong way, the payoff was certainly worth it. After doing dishes and cleaning up camp, we sat in the darkness under the blanket of stars. We continued talking as we unwinded from the day. Just before midnight, we crawled into the tent and settled in for a long-awaited night's sleep. Tomorrow would be a busy day, and we still had four days and many more miles of the Arizona Strip to cover. After a cold but restful night, I was up just after sunrise. I immediately set out towards White Pocket to continue exploring. The area was already crawling with other tourists who had made the morning trek out. Luckily, because White Pocket is so spread out, I found myself alone as I walked around. Small puddles of water remained from a recent storm, and around every corner lay a new feature to check out. Long sections of pillow-like white rock draped the area. Small imprints and other imperfections lay on the surface. Steep sections of red and white sandstone intermingled along some of the impressive drop-offs. Small sand dunes and vegetation interjected into the alien landscape. After nearly two hours of walking around, I finally made it back to our camp, where Daniel was just getting up. His air mattress had deflated during the night, but thanks to the soft sand we had camped on, meant that it had been a pretty decent night for both of us. We broke down what was left of camp and loaded up the Jeep. We sat for a few more minutes, overlooking White Pocket as we enjoyed a simple and quick breakfast of donuts. We then hopped in the Jeep to begin another day of the Arizona Strip Trip. Day number two. Here we go. So we got north 
rim. Nice. Point Sublime. And a cabin today. It should be really a great one. We're mostly on time. White pocket. That was beautiful. Yeah, was. We retraced our route 15 miles from White Pocket back out to House Rock Road. The trail was still bumpy and rough, but we had no trouble whatsoever. Once back on House Rock Road, we headed south for about 9 miles towards the pavement before airing back up. Of course, the air compressor was buried in the absolute most inconvenient place. Not long after airing up, we jumped back onto AZ-89A and headed west. Immediately, the road began a rapid climb and it twisted and turned towards Jacob Lake. Just a few minutes later, we continued south on Highway 67 towards Grand Canyon National Park. The road south climbed through wide green meadows as we approached 9,000 feet in elevation. Signs told us to watch for bison and a small amount of snow even remained in some of the shadows. About 40 miles later, we arrived in Grand Canyon National Park. We headed south to the visitor center and overlook where we made a quick stop to check out the view. The north rim is 2,000 feet higher than the south rim, and even though they are only 18 miles apart, nearly 200 miles of road separates them. Not wasting too much time, we headed back north. We wanted to hit a trail that would take us out to one of the best overlooks in the park, Point Sublime. Unfortunately, just a few miles in, we found the trail gated off and closed. So we have to figure out, do we want to go to Fire Point or Tim Point? Not knowing why, we were forced to turn around and come up with a different plan. It was about 2 o'clock when we topped off our gas tank just a few miles north of the National Park at the North Ram Country Store. It was there that we learned that Point Sublime Trail was closed due to numerous downed trees and there was no way to get to the overlook at this time. Because the area is only open after May 15th, our trip early on in the season meant that not all the trails had been cleared yet from the past winter. After consulting the locals and a map of the area, we decided to head for Fire Point to the west of Highway 67. Jeeps, Jeeps everywhere. Oh my god, this is Jeep country, man. We headed back south briefly and turned west onto forest roads. We would follow these for about 20 miles until we reached the overlook. We aired down, but luckily for us, things remained relatively smooth and quick moving. The trail passes through several high elevation sections and aspen trees, as well as cool air greeted us as we moved along. At about 4 p.m., we crossed the cattle guard and the trail got rougher. The trees on either side of the trail were narrow and our pace was slowed. Up ahead was a mud puddle, which as soon as we went through, discovered it was much deeper than expected. Yeah. We kicked it into four wheel drive as we slowly trudged through the deep puddle. <laughs> the Jeep was now caked in a solid layer of mud from the windows down. Not long after though, we arrived at Firepoint. 
The Overlook looks west into the vast expanse that is the Grand Canyon. We took this scenic opportunity to break for a late lunch. We made sandwiches and enjoyed some downtime on the rim of the canyon. However, it was getting late in the day and we still needed to cover about 25 miles of forest roads before our overnight stop. From Fire Point, we continued east for a few miles and then headed north. The windy forest roads were quite scenic. Numerous downed trees all along the road were evidence that this area really can be inaccessible depending on the time of year you come out. We hopped on the smooth Forest Road 22 for a few miles and made up some time. A few minutes later we turned off onto 447. The last 15 miles would be rougher and slower. The trail twisted and turned and eventually we found ourselves at the intersection of 423, just a mile from our cabin. Yep, turn left there. Just after 6.30 p.m., we arrived at Jump Up Cabin at the end of the road. Home sweet home. Let's go. Actually, we need a combination. Wow. This historic cabin was built in the early 1900s and was used by early ranchers and later on by forest rangers. The cabin is available for rent and has access to hiking trails and other off-road trails in the area. We were pleasantly surprised with the cabin's facilities. Luckily, tonight we wouldn't have to set up the tent, the camp box, or anything really. We unloaded our essentials and quickly got a fire going as the sun set. Tonight's dinner would be a simple one, but an old favorite. Fire roasted kielbasa with cheese whiz. What a beautiful thing. We chowed down as we sat around the campfire. Once again, the night sky was impressive. With no towns of any considerable size anywhere close by, we were truly on our own out here. We called it at around 11.30 and retreated inside the rustic cabin for the night. It would be nice to have a roof over our heads and an actual mattress to sleep on before another two nights of camping. Needless to say, we slept like babies. After an incredible night of sleep, we awoke the next morning well rested. We took advantage of the nearby facilities and scarfed down a quick breakfast. After walking around the cabin to check things out in the daylight, we then worked to clean things up and load up the jeep once again. After a quick visit by a local ranger, we departed the cabin. Day number three, 9.29 a.m. Mostly on schedule. Not too bad. Half an hour late like normal. Well, they were less late than we were yesterday. That is true. true. So, let's that is do it. true. Off to Jump Up Point. Fredonia, among so, other things. We headed north for a few miles and made a hard left onto Forest Road 201 at Jump Up Divide. From here, it would be 10 miles of rough trail to get to the scenic jump up point. And the 
trail certainly didn't disappoint. With several washouts, lots of rock ledges, and some narrow sections, we crawled south towards the overlook. Eventually, the road led up and leveled off, and the views immediately improved as we drove along the edge of the cliff. To our left was a thousand foot drop off opened up into a seemingly endless chasm. Shortly thereafter, the trail dead ended literally at the edge of the Grand Canyon. Before us was a tremendous drop off and an impressive overlook of the intersection of Jump Up Canyon and the much larger Grand Canyon. We approached the edge and looked down into the chasm. The Colorado River loomed deep below and incredible rock formations surrounded us on three sides. We let our nerves settle down and took an obligatory jump up picture at Jump Up Overlook. Eventually, we headed back north 10 rough miles and returned to Jump Up Divide. At the intersection, we continued straight onto Forest Road 236 and headed towards Fredonia. The drive smoothed out and was really beautiful as we wound through scenic canyons and past wilderness areas. After 25 miles, we aired up yet again as we arrived back on pavement. Just a few miles later, we rolled into the town of Fredonia. We topped off the Jeep and filled two additional five gallon gas cans with extra fuel, as well as topped off the ice in the coolers. Fredonia was founded in the late 1800s and serves as one of the largest towns on the Arizona Strip with a population of just over 1,000 people. For some strange reason, they have no grocery store though, and we were forced to make the quick jaunt into Kanab, Utah to get a few essentials for tonight's dinner. Within half an hour, we were back in Fredonia and headed west on AZ-389 for just 8 miles to the turnoff for Toro Weep. Toro Weep lies 60 miles south of the highway and remains one of the most remote yet photographed viewpoints of the Grand Canyon. And chances are you've definitely seen this viewpoint on calendars and posters before. We aired down and prepared for the long road ahead. Toro Weep, you ready? Absolutely. How many miles till we see pavement again? Uh, 200 plus. Yeah. Just about. <laughs> so, yep, we're off to Turtle Weep and off to uh, a schoolhouse and then an old mine and a lot of dirt road. And no bathroom. There is a bathroom at Turtle Weep after that now. The reason why we aired down like we did? Uh huh. It's 60 miles, yeah. But according to the National Park Service, one out of four people get a flat tire on this road. Gosh. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah. Just what we needed. Well, that's why we have two spare tires. And a tire patch kit. Boy. And we aired down. All right. Let's go. Where are we? Let me know when I can drive. <laughs> Someday. From here, it would be a couple hundred miles and a couple days before we saw our next sign of civilization. We headed south on the long and straight BLM Route 109, also known as the Sunshine Route. The road was generally fast moving with long stretches of washboards. 
further south we headed, the better the views got. After about 35 miles, the road began to wind and climb. Shortly thereafter, we entered Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument. The views continued to improve as we drove through a wide valley with cliffs on one side and a mountain range on the other. We checked in with the ranger at the 55 mile mark as we blazed through the greater Tuweep metropolitan area. The road got instantly rougher as we crawled along the final few miles. We grabbed a campsite and immediately set up camp. It was just before 7 p.m. and we decided to drive the final mile to the overlook to catch the sunset. After an even rougher four-wheel drive trail, we finally made it to the viewpoint at the end of the trail. Here, a 3,000 foot drop greets those looking into the canyon. It is here where the Grand Canyon is actually the narrowest. The Colorado River thunders nearly a mile below, and the views are simply breathtaking. After enjoying sunset at the viewpoint, we headed back to the campground where we got started on dinner. Tonight, chicken stir fry and rice, and it was absolutely delicious. The campsites at Torawip require a permit from the park service, and chances are you will be joined by numerous others who made the drive as well. The campground is quite nice and has many great spots and two bathrooms. We called it an early night and headed to bed at around 11 o'clock. After another night on the ground, we were up early. We scouted out the surrounding area, which was full of impressive views. We had time for an actually decent breakfast today and we whipped up some eggs and sausage. Not long after, we were packed up and on the road. Today was going to be a long day with about 140 miles planned, all of which were off-road. After leaving the National Park, we turned west and began a rapid climb up Mount Trumbull. The road remained rough and bumpy, but the miles passed quickly. Near the summit of Mount Trumbull, we stopped at a historical marker. We were now at the Sawmill Historic Site, one of the earliest and most productive lumber mill sites on the Arizona Strip. This site in particular was operated and used to create timbers for the nearby Mormon Temple in St. George, Utah, although little actually remains of the mill site today. Leaving uh, Tarweep, Sawmill Historic Site, Mount Trumbull Schoolhouse. Basically getting to the Utah line pretty close tonight, so we'll be uh, nearly done with the Arizona Strip, so let's go. Let's go. We continued west and almost immediately began our descent down Mount Trumbull and into the upper Hurricane Valley. The road got rougher again, but before we knew it, had arrived at a major intersection with a small white building off to our right. We were now at the historic Mount Trumbull Schoolhouse, named for the nearby mountain we had just driven over. Originally built in 1918, the schoolhouse was used for church, town hall meetings, and obviously teaching by the residents that lived in the surrounding valley. It was founded by early Mormon pioneers and homesteaders who lived and worked in this extremely remote area. 
Perhaps the most notable family that lived nearby was the Bundy family, although not that Bundy family. The school operated until the 1960s when the population dwindled. The building was burned down by arsonists in the early 1990s, but since rebuilt to serve as a testament to the history of the area. We walked around inside and out of the building. Numerous artifacts remain scattered around the property and it is truly worth a stop if you're in the area. After our visit, we continued west onto unimproved roads and back into Grand Canyon Parshah National Monument. The roads got rougher again and our pace was slowed for the next 20 miles. After a brief detour on the wrong road, we finally made it to BLM Road 103 by about 2.30. Our campsite for the night was to the right, but there was something to the left that I really wanted to see. A brief stint of fast moving road was followed by another section of slow and go. For 15 miles, we crawled through washed out river bottoms, scenic canyons, and finally into the Grand Wash Cliffs. By around 4 o'clock, we finally made it to our destination, Grand Gulch Mine. Grand Gulch Mine is a historic copper mine that sits at the base of the scenic Grand Wash Cliffs. The mine opened in around 1878 and was one of the more productive mines in the area. Copper ore was pulled out of the ground and transported to a railhead over 400 miles away in Salt Lake City. The mine was considered to be one of the richest copper loads in the Arizona Territory, but its lack of easy access meant its success would be severely limited. At its peak, in the early 1900s, about 80 people lived here. The mine was shut down for nearly 20 years following World War I when prices plummeted. It reopened during World War II and large trucks were used to haul out ore. The mine was closed down in 1958 following a fire and the steady drop off of mineral wealth. Today, the old bunkhouse, mine headquarters, two original dump trucks, and several other foundations remain. It is fascinating to see the site left in nearly original shape following its demise. However, it was now getting late in the day and we still had a 15 mile drive back out to the main road and there were still over 60 miles to get to our campsite. We retraced the rough 15 miles through the upper Grand Wash Cliffs and ultimately ended up back on BLM Route 103. We headed north for several miles until reaching Route 1003. The road swung west here and headed into Hidden Canyon. Things got rougher and slower as we crawled along the wash bottom. Oh. Oh. I am crawling. Oh, what are you doing? I am, I am crawling. What are you doing, dude? Will you stop? <laughs> We passed through a section of Joshua trees and the stark beauty of the region was really something. It was around 6.30 when we cleared the canyon and began our climb out. However, things got rougher still. According to the BLM map of the National Monument, we only had about three more miles of the rough stuff. As it turns out, those three miles would take nearly an hour. 
We crawled along in four-wheel drive, along the edge of the cliff as steep drop-offs and large boulders meant that we could literally only go a few miles an hour or risk breaking something on the jeep and getting stuck. It was around sunset, about 7.30 when we cleared the shelf road and were back on flatter ground. There was still a problem, however. The road wasn't any smoother. For the next 25 miles, we crawled along. Through canyon after canyon and numerous creek bottoms, it was slow and go as the hours rolled by. Fortunately, the Jeep had plenty of lights to illuminate the trail in this otherwise completely dark region. Our frustration mounted as we continued the agonizing drive. At least if it had been daytime, we could have enjoyed the incredible views. We finally made it onto Route 242 and suddenly began a rapid climb. We were now in the Virgin Mountains. Our campsite was just a few miles ahead. We crested the pass and exited out of the Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument. Of course, as if things weren't bad enough, we lost our GPS in the center console in the small hole where the e-brake is, so we now didn't know where exactly our campsite was. Eventually, we began our descent and found the campsite. The only problem, because it was so late, someone had already claimed it. We continued down the mountain and ultimately found a nice spot a couple of miles down the road. It was now 10.30 and we had been driving for a solid 12 hours. A little upset and absolutely done for the day, we set up our tent in the dark. We quickly got a fire going. Tonight's dinner was supposed to be a retry of the chili and cornbread we messed up last year on El Camino, but because it was so late, we resorted to kielbasa leftovers and some beer. After a long and grueling day yesterday, we were looking forward to waking up late. However, since we camped just a few yards off a major road into Lime Kiln Canyon, that wasn't going to happen. We stumbled out of the tent and were pleasantly surprised by the view. It was around 7.30 when we were sitting around the now cold campfire when a trailer pulled up and we heard commotion. Across the canyon, we saw what was happening. A rancher was on horseback trying to round up some rogue cattle that had been wandering up the canyon. His wife parked their trailer on the road in hopes of taking them back to their ranch. Unfortunately, I'm not entirely sure if they actually got them back onto the trailer. We broke down camp and loaded up the Jeep one last time. Day five, last day. last day on the trip, got literally 10 miles left, Thank you. and after yesterday, uh, yeah. that is much needed. We, we just don't talk about yesterday. <laughs> last night did not Ever. happen. Yeah. We're just going to pretend it didn't happen. So 10 miles, one hour Hopefully. of highway, and then Vegas. Wow. Let's go. How long should it take on the dirt road? Well, if it's anything like yesterday, it's going to take about four hours to get The trip down the mountain was quick. The trail was wide and decently maintained. Certainly much better than what we had experienced last night. Within half an hour, we were back on level ground with Mesquite, Nevada out our windshield. We crossed the state line at around 11 a.m. 
leaving behind Arizona and the stunning Arizona Strip we had experienced over the past five days. Within a few minutes, the paved road was in sight. We aired up as we prepared for highway cruising the rest of the way home. We topped off the tank one last time and hit Interstate 15 southbound. It was only an hour to Vegas and the time passed quickly. Vegas came into view as we dropped into the sweltering valley. We cruised down the strip. The completely filthy Jeep probably didn't belong here, but that wasn't going to stop us. Oh, don't forget to uh, take off. CB. Oh yeah, that's gonna be a problem. Here, hold this. <laughs> Ow. We parked the Jeep in the garage and checked into the hotel. We flipped a coin for the shower and scrubbed off about three and a half pounds of dirt each. It was so nice to have AC, a flushing toilet, and most importantly, a shower and a comfy bed. As night descended, we headed out to engage in the debauchery that is Las Vegas. Utterly exhausted from the culmination of the last five days, we crashed early at around 2 a.m. We awoke the next morning and set out for the long drive home. The Jeep fired right up and we hit lunch to grab burgers in Boulder City before the long four and a half hour drive home. The Arizona Strip was phenomenal and can't wait to go back. But I, right now I can't wait for food, so let's, do let's it. grab some food and Shut her down. The five days and roughly 750 miles we covered in the Arizona Strip trip was our longest and arguably most rewarding trip to date. With lack of any easy access, you truly have to want to explore this remote and scenic region. Be sure to check out our trip summary and individual trail and historic site pages over on our website if you're planning a trip to this area. If you're planning a trip, you should be totally prepared to be on your own, but it is absolutely worth the effort. Definitely vodka. Anyway. Nice. That's what I get for driving on a bumpy road, I guess. Look at that. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is fun. Alright, Scotty, you go. It's your people. Oh. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, you're you're the one communicating with them. Video late. Okay. Sorry. Ow. I was trying to aim it away. Thank you. All right. See you next week. That is payback for El Camino, friend. For what? El Camino, you did that to me, except you went like a quarter mile. Oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're good.
Are you freaking kidding me? No way. Oh my god. <laughs> what? No the hell? There's your toilet, bro. <laughs> Oh my god, yes. Yes, look at it. You get to sit and enjoy the nature. Wow. That's pretty awesome, I'm not gonna lie. Hold it. I'm kind of excited to use it. What are you talking about? How was it? Interesting. Do it again? Sure. If I have to. <laughs> Fair enough, you heard it from him. What? Holy hell. I just saw that. Oh lord. Evacuate. Get out. 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 Bail. Bail. Where is it? Bail. It's on the stereo. Oh my god. What? It's on the solar panel. Don't use my Patriots hat. What the hell, man? Come on. I don't have Are any. you kidding me? Do you oh. want me to use a shoe on your stereo? Go. Just go. Don't. Okay. Where to go? It's down here. All right. Whoa. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. That was fun. What are we on? Day five now? Day four. You sure? Okay, now we gotta take a picture. <laughs> that was awesome, man. Easy does it. Oh, the gas. No break. Oh boy. No more gas. No break. Okay. Easy does it. There you go. Wow. Oh, wow. I just realized. Yeah. I did all that too. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad. You spun the wheels a little bit, but uh, not too bad. Yeah. Probably should have tossed it in four for you just in case. But hey, we made it. Just mind your business.